grateful that you're here. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can uh, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be all over the place today. Uh, but this one thing has just been really uh, something that I can't get off my mind. And this, it's just this little text uh, that is, is fit in the book of Psalms. And in Psalms uh, chapter 8, verse 4, uh, it simply says, What is man that you are mindful of him, that the son of man that you care for him? Uh, after last week, we began this message series called All and Wonder. I can't help but think that in this incredible cosmos, uh, that God would be interested in these beings, and, and which are so minuscule and so tiny when you think about the entire cosmos, that God would be interested in us is an amazing, an amazing, an amazing thing. And I'm in awe of that fact that God cares deeply for me. And I don't know about you, uh, but you might think uh, something about me like, hey, this guy um, is, is confident. Uh, you might think, oh, he's, he's got it together uh, because you just, you know me in many ways in a limited way for so many of you. Some of you, you see me on stage on a Sunday, you might run into me at a restaurant. Uh, but here's what I want you to realize is that I am totally insecure in many ways. Uh, that there are ways that I look at my life. And even as I think about as I walked out today on this stage to teach you the word of God, how insecure I am in that. Uh, that there are so many weekends that I get up here and I'm like, Lord, I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to connect with anyone. Uh, and I'm nervous, and I've got butterflies in my stomach. And listen, that never goes away. Like, I, I'm not, I don't get out here and go, hey, man, I think I've got this message that's so killer that everybody has to be here this weekend. Like, that's just never what happens in the depth of my soul. Every Saturday, I spend time thinking about what I'm going to do. And oftentimes, it's just this thought that I can't get off my brain because I'm like, I just, I'm not sure if I'm totally prepared. I, I'm not, maybe I've got some finishing touchings and, touches. And so I walk around and, and literally I have a pen in my hand and all morning I just continue to write and mark out and scratch out. And, every, and I do it all day, even up to the point of just a few minutes ago. I'm still writing, correcting, doing all these different things. And I tell you all that because as I was reading through uh, the scriptures this week, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I stumbled across a text that was just really meaningful and rich to me. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 1, um, it just simply says, uh, as Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, he just says, hey, I want you to know that in every way you were enriched in him and all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking anything in, in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. And I don't know about you, but as I was reading just this week, uh, that, that I happened to read that on Monday and again on Tuesday, and I shared that even with my community uh, on Wednesday night as we gathered our journey group. I was like, listen, I don't know about you, but this is just kind of the message that I have um, for you guys and even for me is that in the Lord sufficient in all things and all of our weaknesses, he's strong uh, in all of our inadequacies. He is enough. And it's just hope and confirmation to me today um, that he is mindful of me. God, who are you that you would be mindful of us as men? Like as, as minuscule as we are and, and all that you have created, the vast span of all that you've done, Lord, you are concerned with me. And not only concerned with me, but you have equipped me for everything I need in the gospel. That because of your son, because of Jesus, because of his uh, death on the cross, his bloodshed and his resurrection, I don't have to walk through life aimless in a pursuit of nothingness that everything I do under the sun is not toil and, and, and is meaningless, as Solomon would say, but it has a purpose. And God is enriching me, and he cares deeply for me. I don't know about you, but that was really incredible as I read that this week. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes you may wonder, well, how do you know that God has a purpose and a plan for you? And how do you know that he really has a desire to do something in your life? And how, how do you know that? And here, here's how you know it. It's because you begin to study the word of God. It's that you begin to allow his word, not just spoken, uh, but also written, to begin to be saturated in your heart and your life. And so here, here's what I want you to see today, is that God is mindful of you in this way, that he gives you his word. 
have a problem right now in finances or in your marriage or in your workplace or have a struggle in relationships or maybe you're just seeking wisdom on where it is that God would have you and your family go uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a family to a church, a body of believers to connect with. Hey, listen, your word is what allows us to navigate through such things. And the question is, is what makes this word worth reading? Like, is this word really something we should do? Um, is it simply because uh, people tell us that? Or is it because it's something amazing about it? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to be in awe of God's word today. I want you to be in awe of what it is that I have in my hands and that you might have in your hands or possibly even on a bookshelf at your house collecting dust. Why is this important? And there's just a handful of things I want you to see. One is I want you to see the production of this book. This pro- the production of this book is absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, we get our Bible, uh, and it's composed of this, this word uh, called Biblia, and Biblia literally just means books. Now, when you think about your Bible, what you need to know is that it's not just one book. It is one book that's composed of many books. Matter of fact, there's 66 separate books in your Bible. A real clever little fact is this, and I didn't share it with the other service. I'm going to share it just with you, okay? Um, If you have the word new, you have how many letters in the word new? Count them up. Okay, let's try that again because y'all aren't participating, and I know they're not in Edgewood. So let's try that one more time. How many? Three. Three. Okay, now here's the, here's the challenge. You ready? Testament. How many are in Testament? You're like, I'm going to give you a second. Go ahead. Nine. Nine. Wow, some sharp teenagers up here. Okay, so here's what you got in the Old Testament. You got three and nine. You got 39. That's how many Old Testament books you have. And then here's what you do. You go to the New Testament. You got new. How many... No, old is, old is uh, three and nine. I might have just cha- changed that on you. Sorry about that. <laughs> See my insufficiencies? See what I'm saying? I don't have it together. Miss it. Like say, think I said something and it didn't really. Uh, so old is three. Testament's nine. You got 39 Old Testament. New is how many? Three. Testament is? So you have how much? No, because 39 and 39 don't make 66. And so what you do is you multiply the three and the nine, and you get 27. And so 39 and 27 make 66 books of our Bible. Okay? Um, so there you go. That's, that's a fun fact for you uh, to remember. Uh, the Bible, uh, 66 books, were composed over a, a period of 1,500 years. They were composed uh, in three different languages. Hebrew, a little bit in, in Aramaic in the book of Daniel, and you also have Greek New Testament. Uh, and then here's what you need to know as well. Is they're written and composed on three different continents, Africa, Europe, Asia. And then not only that, they had 40 different authors, 40 different authors, including uh, guys like Moses who were murderer. Or you had kings. Uh, you, had, um, you had people uh, like shepherds or scribes. Or you had sinful tax collectors. You had a guy like Luke who was a physician. You had all types of different backgrounds composed uh, in, in this this. Bible, this narrative. And what's amazing about that is if you were to take a book over 1,500 years on three different continents, three different languages, um, all these different types of people, do you think that you could consistently get something that was meaningful and, and somewhat held together with some sort of general revelation? And I would say absolutely not. But it is an amazing thing that when you look at the Bible, it begins with the words, in the beginning God created, and it ends with the words, Jesus saying, lo and behold, I am coming again. And then everything in between talks about these few things, the fall of man, um, the creation. From there, it talks about redemption, about how man could be reconciled to God, and then also restoration, that one day God is going to make everything right. And that's the story of your Bible. And it's, it's so rich and it is so dependable that even though you've got the incredible diversity of 1,500 different years, uh, all the different authors, different continents, different languages, that in, in the midst of all that diversity, you've got an incredible amount of unity that we would have this Bible. What's crazy about that is when you start thinking about not only the production, you have to also think about the preservation. That if this, this text right here is ancient, it's old, it's thousands of years old, the question is, is how do I have a manuscript in my hand and how do I know um, that, that the manuscript in your hand is not only reliable, but it's trustworthy? And more than that, how in the world is it still here? Because there's so many other texts in the world that aren't as old as these texts that aren't with us anymore. So how does that even happen? And I would just tell you, it has to be by God's preservation. 
God has preserved his text. Matter of fact, in uh, about 300 uh, AD, there was a guy named Diocletian. He was a Roman emperor, and he wanted not only Christianity destroyed, but he actually uh, kind of made it uh, an edict in his province and in, in Rome that he was going to burn and destroy every Bible there was. And so he set out on a quest to do destruction, not only among Christians, but also the texts that were being circulated in that day and time. Uh, there was a guy named Voltaire. He was a French infidel in the 1700s. In 1778, he made the comment, with 100 years of my death, Christianity and the Bible will actually be no more. Now, that's a pretty uh, arrogant assumption, the fact that Jesus had already uh, been, been away in, in that sense for 1,700 years. And so uh, 1,700 years after the early church was established, he said 100 years, it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, 50 years after uh, he died, they were actually using his house as a Bible printing press. And so just be careful what you say. Um, and here's why, because God preserves his word. And he's done that through a variety of things. So just a couple of things to consider. One of the preservation methods has just been historical. God is in historical matters has confirmed his word. Um, even though you and I might have had doubts or those that came before us had doubts, there have been many things that have happened even in the span of the last hundred years that have really confirmed the usefulness and the reliability of God's word. In the 1960s, in ancient uh, North Syria, in kind of this community uh, near Ebla, uh, there were 15,000 to 17,000 tablets that produced and unveiled all the cities of the plain, which up to that time, many people debated whether the cities of the plain in Genesis uh, 14 actually existed. Now, two of the cities of the plain that you'd be familiar with are these two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And so up until the 1960s, people would say well, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't really actually exist until... They discovered that in the 1960s, and it proved that history was indeed correct. Very similar thing uh, happened with the city of Nineveh. Nineveh, uh, if you remember, there's a guy named Jonah. Jonah ran from the Lord because the Lord told him to go to the capital city of Assyria, and hey, tell them to repent. And Jonah goes, no way, I'm not going. Uh, he didn't believe that they needed uh, to have grace and, and to be able to have repentance because they were so evil. Uh, nonetheless, he finally uh, does what the Lord asked him to do, and the people of, uh, of Nineveh repent. A hundred years later, though, a guy uh, called Nahum, a little prophet in our Old Testament, uh, he writes to, to, uh, and, and goes um, to this city called Nineveh, and he goes, hey, listen, you might have repented a hundred years ago, uh, but the problem is I don't see repentance now. The Lord is going to destroy you. And sure enough, Nahum walks them through methodically how it's going to happen. And what's crazy is, is it did indeed happen in history. The problem is, is that no one knew that it happened because we didn't know if the city really existed. Why didn't you know the city existed? Because nobody had ever found it. And so history has to meet archaeology. And when archaeological discoveries finally begin to happen, you begin to realize that history is, in fact, history. So in 1842 and 1843, there were a group of people that went on a quest, and they unearthed and discovered the capital city of Nineveh. Burned in about two to three feet of rubble, it was exactly as Nahum said it would happen. And guess what? That just like, it just confirms in my heart and my soul, like, Lord, not only are you historically accurate, but archaeological digs continue to prove that. One of the greatest archaeological discoveries in our day and time would have happened in some of your lifetimes was in the 1940s and 50s uh, as a, a couple of Bedouin shepherds found outside of this, this place called the Qumran community called what's the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls unearthed all of our Old Testament books except for one, and that was the book of Esther. And we have partials or even whole fragments of every book in our Old Testament found in that archaeological discovery. What's incredible is if I were to take the book of Isaiah, which is the most lengthy book, and I were to lay it over my, my actual copy right now, you would be surprised at the, the accuracy in which it holds. It's an amazing, an amazing thing. Now, here's the deal. you got to go, well, when, 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 did that, when did those manuscripts that they found in the Qumran community called the Dead Sea Scrolls, like how long ago was they written? And so what they would say is maybe carbon dating 150 to 300 years before Christ. Not the 700 that we would claim that Isaiah wrote that. But listen, what is the proof that anybody would write 150 or even 300 years before a figure would come and all those prophecies would come true in one man? See, that's what makes the, the Bible so amazing as well. It's not just the archaeological side of things, but that it, it, it never is refuted by other things like prophecy. And so uh, you just got to think through that the, the, the things that we have are really important. 
Even science doesn't negate what you see in the text. Uh, you, you can know that the Lord is working in many ways to fulfill things. Uh, oftentimes, what we might even hear somebody say is, well, the Bible contradicts itself, and it contradicts it when it comes to science. And here's what I would just tell you. A quote that I read this week, the Bible never actually contradicts itself. The reason people don't like the Bible is it contradicts their own lifestyle. And so I think that's the challenge. We could say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it really doesn't. What the Bible does is it contra- contradicts lifestyle. And so let me just kind of talk real quick science with you. Um, I could talk hours about the Bible and its productivity in our lives and about all of these different things. Let me just put something in your mind real quickly. There's an age-old question that I think always uh, has stirred us, and that is, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay. Um, hey, so have you ever thought about that? Can I just answer it for you real quickly? The chicken came first. And then you got to ask yourself this question. Well, how old was the chicken when it came? And the answer is, I don't know. Matter of fact, you got to ask yourself this question. How old was Adam and Eve when they came? Because obviously we know biologically that they could conceive and bear children in which they were encouraged to do. And so how old were they? We don't know. So the question that you got to ask yourself is, how do you carbon date something that you don't know the age of? Because even though I would claim to believe that the earth is not much over, say, 6,000 years old, and you're like, oh, it's millions of years older than that. Listen, I would disagree with you, and I would disagree with science practices in our public schools that would teach such. But here's what I would say. How do you carbon date something that, that the beginning, that the chief creator is God, and which has always been, and you can't carbon date him, he's existed forever, steps into space and time, and he creates something that's mature. How do you carbon date something that was mature? And so I get there's a lot of things happening in science right now. When you think about your scriptures and about your Bible, I want you to realize there is equally as much scientific data out there that would suggest what I'm talking about as something different. But the question you've got to ask yourself is, did God create a mature earth? Or did he create everything with eggs in which when they were produced, they were just merely days old? And I would say he created a mature earth. So when God sets an oak tree into motion, how old is the oak tree? That's something you can talk about and think about the rest of your afternoon. Good luck with that. <laughs> pray, pray for you. And, and, but you have to think of it in that way. God creates something mature. Science does not refute biblical things, nor does the Bible contradict science per se in every area. They work a lot of ways hand in hand. Encourage you to think through that. The question then becomes, but okay, if, if you've got this incredible uh, productivity and, and you've got this in, incredible um, work of God as, as you not only have the Bible produced, but you also have it uh, preserved, then what's next? And here's the deal, prophecy. Prophecy is an incredible thing, and you have prophecy throughout your entire Bible. Matter of fact, it's prophets like Nahum that give me a spine and an incredible backbone, because Nahum, he shared exactly what would happen with Nineveh. It happened, and history and archaeological discoveries prove that. Here's the deal. Same with Isaiah. Isaiah tells us 700 years before Christ ever comes on the scene how he would come. Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, Micah chapter 5 tells us that he's going to show up in Bethlehem. Uh, Isaiah 50 3 tells us not only what Jesus would look like of no comely appearance, but he tells us how he's going to die. And about 25 to 28 prophecies happen in Isaiah 53 alone in one 24-hour period in which Jesus, according to the scriptures, he fulfilled them all. Now the question is, is how many prophecies are there that have been fulfilled? And I would say there are hundreds, and there are still some that have not been fulfilled because we are waiting on Christ to return for his people. But what I want you to realize is if you were just to take a handful of those, like let's just say you took 48 key prophecies in all your Bible on which there are um, six or seven times that easily. But let's just say you were to take 48 and you were to say they were going to be true in one man. What would the odds of that look like in our life? Well, here's what the odds would look like in our life. It would be like one of us in this room playing the, Amer- the, the lottery as we know it in America and winning it 20 consecutive times. So what are the odds of you winning it once in your lifetime? So what are the odds of you winning it 20 times in your lifetime? That's the incredible odds we're talking about, about prophecy coming true in one man named Jesus. And so when we're talking about the Bible, hey, we're not talking about some stories and fables, and we're not asking the question of, hey, did somebody really get swallowed by a well? Like, do you really believe that? Do you really believe a man who was dead came back to life? Which one's more incredible? A well or a dead man walking? 
a dead man walking. If God can resurrect a dead man, which I've never seen happen, and I officed in the funeral home for five and a half years. If that's not happened, the question is, should we believe this text? And I would say yes, because of prophecy. And then let alone, if we were to take prophecy off the table, here's why you should believe it is because of the power of God. It changes lives. Can I tell you, the only reason I'm here up on this stage is not because um, at 12 years old, I discovered uh, history and science and archaeological principles. Is at 12 years old, I realized that I was a sinful, wretched little boy that I was wicked in my heart, that I was selfish in all my ways, and that even though I loved my brothers, I really hated them in many ways. And I had to wrestle with that as the Lord began to change my heart. And he did that as he showed me the word of God. And over the last couple, uh, 20, 25 years, I have sought to discover the word and to know the word and apply the word. And it's changed my life. And one incredible thing about us and this body is that God has used the word of God over the last almost decade to change many lives as it has, in a sense, hit you head on. And you have had a collision, not only with the son of God, but also the word in which he has spoken to and through his people here. And it's changed lives. And that is the most meaningful thing that many of us, hundreds of us could say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but I now see. I once was lame, but I now walk. I once was an alien, but now I'm a part of the family. I once was estranged, but now I'm a son or I'm a daughter. And that's what the word of God does. And we praise him for it. And that's why we need the word of God. Here's the question you have to ask yourself is, do I really need the Word of God, and how often should I read it? Do I read it just a few days a week, or do I read it every other day? Do I do it out of form, meaning I just check off a box, or do I, do I have a principal function for the Word of God in my life? Like, is, is there really a need for it? And I would say there's actually a need for it. Matter of fact, it reminds me of a story of a pastor who ran into one of his friends. A pastor uh, in a local uh, community had a, a truck that broke down. It was kind of late at night, and so he stumbled in to the edge of town. And right on the edge of town, there was kind of like, like a little brewery, a little pub there. And so he walked into the pub because he was going to ask for, for a little bit of help and pr- probably just a ride home. And he stumbled acro- across his friend Frank, in which he hadn't seen at church, but he ran to uh, at the pub. And he goes, Frank, man, how are you? And he goes, man, I'm, I'm okay. And, and Frank was like... He was like stumbling drunk, and uh, Frank began to share a little bit of his story because the pastor asked him, he goes, Frank, man, you don't look so good. And he goes, man, I was, I was so good, but then this life happened, and he goes, I gambled all my money away, and my wife left me, and now I've just got all these rags, and he just looked bad, didn't have good clothes on, didn't smell all that good. And you could just tell that Frank had had a really rough handful of months in which he just said, I am a mess. And so the pastor says, well, hey, I tell you what, why don't you go home? And, and I know you got a Bible, so go ahead and get in your Bible. And he goes, I just encourage you to open up your Bible, find the first place, put your finger on it, and start reading. A couple of months later, he runs into Frank again, and Frank is now um, getting out of a, a Ferrari. He's got a Gucci suit on, and he's got a Rolex watch, and the pastor is a little bit confused. He's going, Frank, what in that world happened to you? He goes, Pastor, you would not believe it. Your your word has come true. He goes, your wisdom is all that I needed. He goes, I went that night, I flipped over my Bible, and I turned to chapter 11, and I went and filed bankruptcy, baby. (laughs) That's not how we approach the word of God. I don't recommend uh, that plan. I don't recommend, hey, just flinging it open, finding a spot, and reading, and hoping for the best. Matter of fact, I would say that we don't even approach the Bible selfishly. We don't approach it with, hey, I need just one source of wisdom, one nugget of truth for this day. God is not a genie. He is our heavenly father. We need to know the, the character of our father, and we need to seek to apply that character to our lives. It is a relationship that is daily maintained as we come to God under the banner of his grace, knowing that the most amazing thing and him being mindful of us, enriching us in every good way, is that he has communicated to us through his word. And there's so many things right now that we're praying for that God's already answered in his word if we'll simply read it and seek it out. There's many of things that we're praying for selfishly that don't align with his word and God's not going to answer because it's a contradiction to what he wants to do for his children. The reality is if you want to know what God wants and how he's communicating, you have to know how he's already spoken. 
and what his desires are, and we align our hearts. And so what is his desire for you? The first one is that you would be nourished. The reason God gives us his word is to nourish you, to grow you up in maturity. I'm going to, give, I'm going to read one. I'm going to give you a reference for another one to look up on your own. 1 Peter 2, verse 2 and 3 says, Like newborn bur- uh, babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. One of the ways we grow in our relationship with God, we move from infants to maturity, is the word of God. So you might look at a malnourished child and you would go, that parent is not feeding their kid. Listen, may it not be said of us that we're malnourished because our father has not given a good provision for us. He has given us everything we need, as Peter would say, that pertains to life and godliness. May we read his word for a source of nourishment in our life. That's a great passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, and which is a good parallel text for you. I'm not going to read it all for you, uh, but I want to encourage you to take some time. The very last part of that says, Solid food is for mature, by who constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so the reason we have the Word of God is to nourish us, to equip us, to grow us up, and to help us distinguish good from evil, which is what I would call not just nourishment, but equipping. And so the second thing is to equip us. The reason we use the text as 2 Timothy is encouraged by his buddy Paul is to equip us. Matter of fact, this is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 12 and following. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. As for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know these from whom you've learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says these words, all Scripture is God-breathed. That means they're produced by God, preserved from God, they are prophecy from God, and they are life changed from God. They're all God-breathed, God-inspired, and they're useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God might be thoroughly equipped in every good work. The idea that he says, he goes, listen, in a world that's difficult, there's evildoers, there's imposters, there are people who are going to scheme, there's an enemy that's real, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. He's prowling around, uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, like a roaring lion, looking, seeking for someone to devour and destroy. He goes, you need to be equipped. That means you have to be ready against the schemes of the enemy. And God's word allows you to do that. And so equipping us means that in a world that is going one direction, we would be children going a different one towards our father. That we wouldn't look malnourished or ill-equipped, but that we would be ready to stand on the truth and the word of God, which is our firm foundation. Amen? The reason why is because it doesn't just equip us, but it protects us against that enemy that I'm talking about. But it doesn't just protect us against the enemy that's real, but it also protects us against shallow beliefs in our culture. The, the imposters, the evildoers, as Ephesians would say, the, those that have crafty and cunning schemes, those that want to, in a sense, lead us astray. Uh, Paul tells the church in Colossae, in Colossians 2, verses, or chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. So then, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted, built up, strength of faith. Uh, as you've been taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See that it, no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Because be careful of what you read and about what you believe. Be careful about those that teach that, hey, all you got to do is look for a word from God to you today and you can go and be who you want to be. You remember the pastor I just told you about and his wisdom? That's not what I would call godly wisdom. Have the ability to discern between what is godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. What is selfish in its desire, what is self-seeking, and what is servant minded and what is selfless because the word of God is servant minded. It's selfless. It's not self-seeking and it's not shallow. Oftentimes I just say, say this, um, if it's not in context, it's a con. And so you have to read the word of God in context and which I'll show you in a few moments. 
It also protects us just from sin. Psalm 119 uh, is an incredible psalm, the longest one in your Bible. It says in verse 10 through 12, I will seek you, O Lord, with all my heart. Hey, do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you. Lord, teach me your decrees. Our heart ought to be, Lord, teach me as your children what it looks like to live in the character of our Father. That should be our aim. And we do that when we reflect and apply. Um, matter of fact, uh, when we think about this, Albert Einstein once said, he who can no longer pause to wonder is as good as dead. Those who never reflect anymore, he goes, why live? If you're not thinking about the things that are going on around you, if you don't take time to meditate and, and seek to apply those things, he goes, you might as well not be living because the purpose of life is to reflect on the awe and the wonder and the glory of the things that are happening around us. And listen, I'll tell you that the greatest awe and wonder that there is is that God has spoken to us through his word and he goes, now reflect, meditate, read, and apply this to your life. And so that's the provision of God. Let me just read a couple of texts to you. James 1, 21 through 25 says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted to you, which can save you. Hey, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And then he gives this incredible passage in which we can apply even to our own lives. He goes, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and afterwards looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, it gives freedom and continues in it. Not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. Now, listen, when I read this passage right here, I can easily see how some of us dudes could look at the mirror and intently walk away and forget exactly what happened. But ladies, I don't believe that about most of you. You spend hours in front of the mirror. And it is not possible for you to spend hours in front of the mirror and then walk away and forget what, what you look like. The reality is, is that's what the Word of God does. It allows us to introspectively reflect, meditate on the words of God, and then seek to apply them in a practical way. Psalm 1, a great passage, just reminds us of what it looks like to, not, uh, to walk in step with the wicked or stand in the seat of sinners or scoffers or the company of mockers, but to the light and the law of the Lord. It shows us what it looks like to meditate on His, his uh, law day and night. And so here's the question that you have to ask yourself. How do I do that practically? And so let me just close with this. Practically, when you come to the Word of God, you have to realize that it is to train you and equip you towards righteousness. And so what you want to do is you want to seek to abide with God in His Word daily. Now, not in a legalistic way, not in a way that you can say, oh, I did it and I can check it off my list. That's form, that's not function. There's many of us that we're in journey groups to check it off the list, to get somebody off our back. That's not the function. The function of community is that we would live together in community, bear one another's burdens, that we would care for one another, we'd equip one another, we'd ask really good questions about one another, we'd confess sin to one another. Like, we get to choose. How are we going to preach our, approach our Bible? We approach it with the idea that it's valuable and useful for our life. But as you're reading it, I think there's a handful of things that you can ask as you read. And so let me provide these for you. And in a second, I encourage you to take out your phone and you can snap a shot of them. I wouldn't do it yet because I'm going to provide all these questions for you instead of one by one. And so instead of you having nine different pictures, let's just do one. And so here we go. Here are some questions every day you can ask. If you are here and you're like, I don't have my phone, I'm not going to write them down. All you got to do is, is go uh, to stonepointchurch.com uh, Stone forward slash Stonepoint News if you're not already signed up. Stonepoint News will be in your email box tomorrow, and all these questions will be on here for you to reflect on. Okay? And so that's stonepointchurch.com forward slash Stonepoint News. You can register right now. If you're already uh, subscribed to the Stonepoint News, it'll be there for you. You don't even have to take a picture. If you don't have any of those things, you're not going to do any of those things, I encourage you to take a picture. Here it is. What does the passage teach me about God? What does the passage teach me about the church, his local body? What does it teach me about the church? What does the passage teach me about the world that I live in? What does the passage teach me about myself, about my own desires, about my own motives? In this scripture, is there a particular sin that is called out that should be avoided in a person's life? Does the passage require me in this particular moment, to take action? If so, what action should I take? Like, what's my next step? Is there something that I need to confess or repent of? 
So does that mean that there's something I've been doing that I need to not do anymore? And I confess that to God, and I confess that to a handful of other people to pray for me, encourage me, and help me walk. I think James 5.16 is a great example of that. Uh, what have I learned from this passage that will help me focus on God and strive for His glory? What do I need to apply? Now, there are many other great questions, like the context, who wrote it, who's he writing to, helping you understand the, the, the setting, the historical narrative. But those are nine or ten great questions there. And so if you want to take a picture of them, I feel, feel free to do that. It's a great chance for you to learn from that. But the reality is the way we approach the Word of God is important. And so let me just walk you through that real quickly. I'm in the book of 1 Corinthians, um, I've, I've struggled in a handful of passages in just chapter 1 this week. Um, here's what it practically looks like for me. Um, in the day that I started out, which was Monday, I did an overall view of the entire chapter. That means I read and I marked, I read it and I marked. Didn't write anything incredibly practical down that day because I was just seeking to understand the, the, the context, the historical framework. I was in that book for about 45 minutes that morning. Tuesday, I read verses 1 through about 9 um, because the first two or three verses were the greeting of Paul. And, and so I spent a little bit of time on that, but I really, if I'm confessing, I, I started verses 4 through 9. And here's what it looked like that day. As I'm thinking about being enriched in every way, the very end of the day, I write in my journal, which many of you would have an all in wonder journal, or maybe you have another one. I just write the text on what I'm studying, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 5 through 9. And then I just write a little prayer. And it's like, Lord, thank you for teaching me through your word. Thank you that you care and you're mindful of me. This question I've been having on my heart and my mind all week. And then I just wrote something like, Thank you that I'm enriched in every good way and that you've provided everything I need. That you hadn't left me to my own devices because, Lord, I know, confession, I'm selfish to do what's right in my own eyes. And without your wisdom and without your knowledge, I am prone to leave the God I love. Help me today to walk in your spirit and not in my own fleshly desires. Amen. As I move on to another day, I stumble across a day in which Paul is talking to the church of Corinth, and this is what he says. He goes, hey, uh, there's some dissension and some, some arguing and grumbling amongst the Corinthian church. Y'all are all bragging about who baptized you. And he goes, um, maybe you're asking the question, did Paul baptize me, or did Apollos baptize me, or did Peter or Cephas baptize me? And then he wrote this in parentheses. He goes, I'm grateful that I only baptized two of you, so you're not arguing about me a whole lot. And then he asked another really good question. He goes, by the way, did, did Paul, did he, was he crucified for you? Hey, was, uh, was um, Apollos, did he die on the cross for you? Hey, did Peter die on the cross for you? He goes, can I just remind you about some of the useless genealogies and myths and factions that y'all are quarreling about? He goes, those things don't matter. Would you just set your eye on the one who does, who died for you? And so here's practically what I can start writing down, because in the last about month, I've come across the same verbiage about five or six different times, whether it be from somebody else, but it's this. And I write down my, my, my little journal, Lord, help me to be about the main thing. Lord, I can be so quick to dispute biblical facts with somebody else, to get in a quarrel, to get in an argument about things that really don't matter. And so, Lord, would you just help me to remember that the cross of Christ, the crucifixion, and your grace abounds in all these things? I need your help because I can be quarrelsome, I can be divisive, I can be argumentative, and Lord, if I'm not careful, I can think that other people are trying to attack me when really they're just asking a really good question. I need your help. Amen. That's what it looks like to examine and apply the text. Now, some of you are like, I, I still need help. Anybody in here like, I still need some help? Okay, praise the Lord. Well, guess what? Starting in February, we're going to do, do two things. On Thursday nights in the middle of January, we're going to set aside about an hour to an hour and a half of time for ladies on the Wills Point campus and Edgewood campus to come and learn how do I study my Bible. We're going to do the same thing starting uh, on the Saturday right before that, and, and that's going to be for men. It's going to be a time called Momentum. Uh, it's going to be four weeks really early before our kids and wives get out of bed. And only the devoted to one to study the Word of God, they will be equipped. And we're going to teach people to study the Bible. Because I think, if I'm not careful, as we think about discipleship and equipping people here, I can think, well, you ought to know how to do this. And many of us, if we reflect back on our life, never had anybody teach us how to study the Bible. 
And so we read it, and we have a very difficult time understanding it, let alone trying to apply it. And so we're just saying, hey, may, not, may that not be the case here anymore. And so we want to help people. And you'll hear all about that next weekend. We love you. We're going to sing a little bit together. Let me pray for us. And uh, may we go in the awe and the wonder of God, thanking him for his amazing word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the uh, provision that you gave us, that you showed us your power, your prophetic ability uh, in all of it, that, Lord, that you preserved it for us. And it had an amazing production, so, so much diversity, so many things to consider. And yet you have one consistent message, and that is that you love your people and you want to redeem them through the cross of Christ. Lord, I pray that as we seek to discover your word, that you would help us to be nourished, equipped, protected, and that, Lord, we would use it to reflect and apply to our life. Help us to see your word differently than maybe we've seen in the past and help us to apply it in a way that moves us and shapes us and conforms us towards your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.